We were told they were enemies, that the division ran deep through belief, culture, and blood. Sunni, Shia, two names that echo through centuries, through sermons and wars, through flags raised and heads severed. But beneath the doctrines, beneath the dynasties, what if the truth wasn't in the politics? What if it was hidden in the blood? This is not about proving one side right. It's not about theology nor ideology. It's about this question. Are Shia and Sunni Muslims genetically different, or are they one people split by power? This is the Chronist. And tonight, we look beyond sex, beyond scripture, into DNA. For over 1,400 years, Muslims have been separated by a single decision. Who should have led after the Prophet Muhammad's death? Was it Abu Bakr, the Prophet's companion? Or Ali, the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law? From that moment, lines were drawn. Lines that would birth wars, define empires, and divide the Ummah, Sunni, Shia. But while the division of belief has deepened over centuries, the genetic division is far less certain. In fact, modern science suggests something both remarkable and inconvenient. It suggests that the difference between Shia and Sunni might be entirely man-made. Not in the genome, not in the flesh, but in history, in narrative, in political memory. Let's start with the facts. There is no Shia gene. No Sunni genome. No marker in your DNA that says Ya Ali or Ya Abu Bakr. Shia and Sunni Muslims exist across dozens of ethnicities. From the mountains of Iran to the deserts of Arabia, from Lebanon to Nigeria, from Pakistan to Indonesia, a Shia in Tehran may be genetically closer to a Sunni in Tehran than to a fellow Shia in Azerbaijan or India. A Sunni in Syria may share more DNA with his Shia neighbor than with a Sunni in Malaysia or Morocco. Why? Because religion is not inherited through blood. It's passed through family, through schooling, through environment, through power. What we're really looking at is not a division of biology, but a divergence of political allegiance and historical trauma. DNA does not follow doctrine. It follows geography climate, marriage, empire, migration. In the early centuries of Islam, conversion spread not by genetics, but by conquest, trade, intermarriage, and Sufi influence. Shia Islam took root in Persia and southern Iraq. Sunni Islam spread across North Africa, South Asia, and beyond. But the genetics remain local. The Persian Shia and Persian Sunni share ancient Persian blood. The Arab Sunni and Arab Shia are often from the same tribal lineages, even the same families. In fact, during the Abbasid and Umayyad eras, people often switched sex based on political safety. Your grandfather might have been Sunni in public and Shia in private, or the other way around. What we call sect was often just a mask worn to survive. But under that mask, the blood was the same. Let's go back to the beginning. The death of the Prophet Muhammad in 632 CE was more than the passing of a man. It was the shattering of unity, the moment where revelation stopped, but ambition began. No succession plan, no written heir, only grief and urgency. And in that vacuum, power did what power always does. It rushed to fill the silence. Some chose Abu Bakr, the Prophet's closest friend, as the first caliph, the steward of the Ummah. Others believe it should have been Ali, the Prophet's cousin and son-in-law, not just by relation, but by divine selection. This wasn't a clash of bloodlines. It wasn't about DNA. It was about interpretation. And underneath that, it was about authority. What followed was not a theological debate. It was a storm a series of civil wars known as the fitna, the first great fracture in Islam. Muslims killing Muslims, brothers turning on brothers, not because their genes were different, but because power demanded loyalty and loyalty demanded division. 
And slowly, what began as a political disagreement hardened into doctrine. The Umayyads, rulers of the first Islamic dynasty, saw Ali's followers as a threat. They painted them as rebels, cursed his name from pulpits, and tried to erase his memory from the collective Islamic consciousness. Then came the Abbasids, who institutionalized Sunni Islam. They built seminaries, schools of law, and libraries, yes. But they also declared which voices were orthodox and which were dangerous. Centuries later, the Safavid Empire in Persia flipped the script. They declared Shia Islam the official state religion, not through Dawa, but through the sword. Entire populations were forced to convert, and those who refused were branded heretics. What had begun as difference became division. Sectarian identity was no longer a matter of belief. It was a matter of survival. And through it all, one thing remained unchanged. The DNA. The Persian who became Shia was still Persian. The Arab who remained Sunni was still Arab. The Turk, the Berber, the South Asian. They passed down their genes, not their sex. Yet the systems built around them, the schools, the mosques, the caliphates, and the states, ensured that those divisions were no longer optional. They became embedded, not in the body, but in the borders, in the books, in the bullets. Even today, ask the average Muslim, why are you Sunni? Why are you Shia? Most cannot trace the answer beyond a few generations because it was never written in blood. It was written in history, or more accurately, rewritten. The split we live with was not chosen. It was engineered, not in chromosomes, but in corridors of power, not by science, but by statcraft. Because power doesn't need your faith to rule you. It just needs your division. The story changes when science speaks. For centuries, the Shia-Sunni divide has been treated as absolute, unbridgeable, essential, almost biological. But modern genetic studies conducted across the Muslim world, in Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Pakistan, and India, tell a different story, a quieter one, but no less powerful. In Iran, both Shia and Sunni populations trace their ancestry to the ancient Indo-Iranians, a civilization that predates Islam by over a thousand years. Whether one prays with arms folded or by their sides, their genes are nearly identical. In Iraq, the supposed heart of Shia resistance and Sunni dominance, DNA shows the same roots, Mesopotamian ancestry. Both sects descend from the same land, same rivers, same empires. The Fertile Crescent didn't choose a sect, it nurtured both. In Lebanon, where political seats are assigned based on sect, genetics tell us something astonishing. Shia Muslims, Sunni Muslims and Maronite Christians often share the same Phoenician lineage. Three identities, one origin. In Pakistan and India, the divide feels sharp. But genetically, Shia and Sunni Muslims share the same South Asian gene pool, descended from pre-Islamic Hindu and Buddhist communities. The conversion to Islam was not done by sword, but through Sufi saints, scholars, and generational persuasion. Across these regions, scientists began noticing a pattern. The differences between Shia and Sunni Muslims were not genetic, but behavioral, cultural, inherited not through DNA, but through memory. One geneticist from the Middle East called it a social filter, not a wall, not a barrier, just a lens that colors how we see each other, but doesn't change what we are. That is a dangerous truth. Because if Shia and Sunni are not biologically distinct, then what justifies the hatred? The sermons of division? The suicide bombings? The drone strikes? The proxy wars? If your blood is the same as your so-called rivals, then the war isn't against the other. It's against yourself. The brother you were told to reject might share the same grandfather. The Amman you curse may descend from the same tribe as your own 
and that realization collapses an empire of propaganda. Because the wars we fight are not born in the blood, they are born in the story. The sectarian myth is not biological, it's narrative warfare, engineered by empires, perpetuated by ignorance, and enforced through fear. But when DNA speaks, it speaks in whispers. And what it whispers is this, you are not enemies by nature, you are only enemies. So why do the wars continue? Because sectarianism is profitable. It fuels arms deals. It props up weak governments. It divides resistance. It distracts from occupation. As long as you believe your neighbor is genetically different, it becomes easier to hate him, to kill him, to forget that he cries, bleeds, and loves like you do. But when you realize that his ancestors might be yours, that his grandmother might have shared bread with yours, suddenly the wall between you begins to crack. And that is what empires fear. The Quran says, Indeed, this community of yours is one community, and I am your Lord, so worship me. Surah al anbiya 21 verses 92. But we have forgotten. We have drawn blood over names. While the oppressor sharpened his sword in silence, this is the chronist, where forgotten truths return to the surface. And if you made it this far, you are not watching by accident. You are part of the remembrance. Because the DNA of this Amma is not divided. It's one and it is ancient. Let them divide our flags. Let them separate our schools. Let them whisper in our ears that we are enemies. But remember this. No sectarian war can erase shared blood. Subscribe, share this before it's buried, and never forget what the science, the soul, and the soil all agree on. We are not enemies. We are strange brothers waiting to remember.